but people are still coming in a little bit. Um, thank you, Taylor, for recording. Um, so we have a few people coming in and we'll go ahead and get started just so we have enough time for all of our presenters. Um, oh, I missed Billie Jean King then, oh, oh, oh well. Um, so welcome to the Government Documents Chair Session. My name is Linda Kellum and I'm the outgoing chair of Godort as at the end of conference, I'll be the outgoing chair or the past chair of Godort. Um, and I'm the senior data librarian at the Cornell Center for Social Sciences. Uh, today's session is on the evictions crisis facing our country. Uh, according to the eviction lab in, at Princeton University, 61 million eviction filings were made between 2000 and 2016. And the Census Bureau's household pulse survey, which we talked about in our Godort session on Thursday, discovered that as of late of as late as of late December 2020, more than 10 million renters are behind on their rent payments and at risk of being evicted. Despite the federal evictions moratorium, which we'll talk about today, hundreds of thousands of renters have been evicted from their home. As the author Matthew Desmond notes, many of these people are one misstep from losing everything. While this is a complex issue, it is a fact that evictions disproportionately impact poor people, people with lower levels of education, people of color, victims of domestic abuse, people with disabilities, and of course, their children. In other words, the people who are already the most vulnerable in American society. And many of us work with these patrons um, in our libraries, not just in public libraries, also in academic libraries. We have patrons who are at risk of being evicted or who have been evicted um, amongst our stu students. So uh, today I'm very uh, pleased to bring three distinguished guests to talk about this issue. Uh, first, we have Deborah Thro Throp. Uh, she is the De Deputy Director of the National Housing Law Project. Deborah's work focuses on federal, state, and local policy advocacy to preserve federal, uh, preserve affordable housing and tenants' rights. She provides training and technical assistance to advocates working with low-income tenants and serves as an advisor and editor of NHLP's seminal publication, HUD Housing Programs, Tenants' Rights. Deborah has testified before Congress about increasing economic mobility in the Housing Choice Voucher Program and improving living conditions for public housing residents. We also have Sharon Sherman. She, she is the executive director of the Greater Syracuse Tenants Network. Uh, the Tenants Network empowers tenants in, in HUD subsidized and private housing to organize tenant associations and advocate for their rights. Sharon provides training to human service case managers and property owners on landlord tenant issues. She answers questions and gives referrals to individual tenants throughout the central New York. And Kim Morell is the engaged Cornell project attorney at Legal Assistance of Western New York in Ithaca, New York. Since receiving her JD from NYU School of Law, she has represented clients in housing matters at Law New York, Legal Services of Central New York, Central New York Fair Housing, Central Jersey Legal Services, and the Legal Aid Society of Rockland County. She has represented tenants from urban, suburban, and rural communities and in private and subsidized housing. And she supported organizing around the issue of lead abatement in housing. Today's panel will provide insight into some of the major issues related to evictions and tenants' rights, as well as the legal and policy landscape. Our presenters will give some resources that we can use to be better informed about the issue. We also hope to hear from you about ways that you are working with your communities. Um, feel free to chat in our discussion area or submit questions. Uh, I think it's actually just the chat that we'll be using today. So feel free to chat with us throughout the presentation. Um, uh, I'll keep an eye on the chats as we go through. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you um, uh, as well as from our presenters. And with that, we will start with Deborah. Great. Thanks so much, Linda. Um, so, and uh, Linda will be moving my slides. Thank you so much. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Deborah Thrope. I'm the Deputy Director of the National Housing Law Project. Um, again, huge thanks to Linda and the entire uh, ALA for having me here today to talk about the eviction crisis um, and how you all as librarians can support your community um, and its members facing that are facing housing instability. I'm really excited to get this invite from, from Linda and the ALA. And we actually had a little um, internal fight uh, at NHLP over who would get to present to the, to, at the ALA conference because we respect the organization and all of you so much. So thanks again for, for having me here. Um, so my organization, NHLP's mission is to advance housing justice 
uh, for poor people and communities. And we achieve this by uh, strengthening and enforcing the rights of tenants, increasing housing opportunities for underserved communities, and preserving and expanding the nation's supply of safe and affordable homes. So our organization also hosts a field network of about 1,800 legal services attorneys and also other housing advocates working in the field. I believe both of our panelists are members of the housing justice um, network, but it's this network that informs all of our policy advocacy. Um, so today I'm going to kind of give you the lay of the land with respect to evictions um, nationally and talk a little bit about the federal protections that are in place right now for tenants as a result of the pandemic. Um, I'm going to highlight some resources along the way for all of you who um, may have an opportunity to help families who are facing housing instability. Um, then I'm going to turn it over to my co-presenters who work directly with at-risk tenants who can talk more about how all of these things play out on the ground. Um, so next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit and start by um, talking a little bit about the crisis that the U.S. was already facing before COVID-19 hit. So we were in an affordable housing crisis nationwide. Uh, there simply isn't enough affordable housing to meet the needs of family across the country, and this probably comes as a surprise to nobody um, that's tuning in today. So as you can see on this map, which is from our partners at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, um, in some states there are less than 30 available and affordable homes for every 100 extremely low income households. Um, nationally, one in four renters are severely cost burdened, which means they spend more than half of their income on housing. And that number is even higher for different households, um, including households with children um, and some of the groups that Linda discussed earlier on in the, in the introduction. Um, and these, what it means is these families are one paycheck away from being forced to choose between food and medical care um, and rent. Um, so, so enter the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so because of this affordable housing crisis that was in place before COVID, the subsequent eviction crisis really has come as, as no surprise. So many families experienced job loss and reduction in hours that made it really difficult to keep up on costs such as rent. Um, so when COVID arrived and the economy started to tank, we and others in the field predicted this tsunami of evictions. Um, and the government, the government responded, all levels of government responded by enacting tenant protections, such as eviction moratorium and federal rental assistance and other measures. And I'm going to talk about some of those today. Um, but this was really, truly unprecedented in the, on the part of the federal government, because up until now, really virtually all eviction policies um, were enacted on a state and local level. So as a result um, of the protections, we've managed to hold back the tsunami. Um, of evictions that we did predict in March 2020, although as Linda also pointed out, there's still a lot of people being evicted during the pandemic. And importantly, these, evict these protections are, many of them have expired or are expiring um, or will expire soon. So it's likely a matter of time before we see the real effects of COVID um, on families and communities with respect to um, renters. Next slide, please. So according to the U.S. Census Bureau's household survey from, from this June, this month, um, there are 7 million households in this country delinquent in rent with 3 million households likely to leave their homes due to eviction within the next two months. Um, so um, how does this compare with, with normal times? Next slide, please. Um, so there are normally on average 3.7 million eviction filings per year. That's a staggering number. Um, so all the data on the slide is from the eviction lab, which um, uh, Linda mentioned, also mentioned in the introduction. It's a research center devoted to tracking evictions nationwide. And it was started by Nat, Matt Desmond, who wrote the book Evicted, which I highly recommend for all of you who have, who have not read it. Um, it paints a really uh, stark picture of all the things we're going to talk about today. Um, but according to the eviction lab, we're missing about 1.3 million filings. Um, so it's, it's likely that a number of the evictions, these 1.3 million evictions that otherwise would have been filed that have not been filed in normal, you know, that have not been filed, um, you know, are, these are the missing evictions. And part of that is because of the tenant protections that are put in place. Um, but again, many of these evictions, uh, many of these protections are, are being faved, uh, phased out. 
Um, so these numbers are, are horrifying for a lot of reasons, that both the regular numbers and sort of what were, you know, the, the wave that we're anticipating. Um, you know, evictions have an enormous impact on families and communities. And one thing that we've learned during the pandemic is that eviction prevention is key to public health, right? Because during the pandemic, one of the reasons we saw the protections was because uh, housing stability was in fact disease prevention. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, but evictions have many other profound effects on families and communities. So for example, eviction ca ca can cause a disruption of employment and education. Families often have to attend court appearances if they're being evicted or they might have to move really quickly. Um, a loss of personal belongings, oftentimes a landlord or a sheriff will actually put somebody's personal property out on the street. Um, an inability to access other housing. Um, if you have an eviction, no matter what the disposition, even if it's just filed, that eviction can end up on your credit report basically forever um, and make it really difficult to access housing in the future. Um, and then evictions also have incredible impacts on communities. When people are displaced, we see loss of workers, um, productivity, a huge impact on schools and childcare providers, because oftentimes have families have to take kids out um, really quickly um, in the case of a, a, a fast moving eviction. Um, so overall evictions uproot families and communities. Next slide, please. Um, and there are also enormous racial and gender disparities among the rates of evictions. Black and Latinx households are a disproportionate share of defendants in eviction cases, and they also receive the lion's share of judgments. And Black women with children in particular are most impacted. And again, this data is from uh, the eviction lab. Um, that shows these these enormous racial disparities, and you know, also important to keep in mind, these are the same communities that were disproportionately impacted by COVID. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so, all levels of government responded in the in the face of of um, the these evictions that were predicted. Um, and they remembered, they responded in a number of ways. So these first two eviction moratoria and rent relief funds um, are really the shorter term strategies to sort of slow everything down and um, stop as many evictions as we can. But then of course, there's also longer term strategies that are needed to protect tenants in the face of this affordable housing crisis in the long, in the long term. Um, so first eviction moratorium, um, you know, generally, of course, prevent displacement of families, but what it also does is buys, buys time for families to access the emergency rental assistance dollars that are um, currently in the, in the community. And I'll talk more about that too. Um, but eviction moratoria generally stop not only evictions, but utility disconnections as well. And then of course, coupled with this rental assistance, which pays the rent arrears, um, pays back all the money the tenant owes, and importantly, will make a landlord whole. Um, in the process. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about the federal eviction moratorium that was put in place for many tenants. There was first one under the CARES Act, um, but then uh, the Center for Disease Control later issued an order that halted many evictions. And they did that on the grounds that stopping evictions would help to slow the spread of COVID, right? So it's in the best interest um, of uh, the nation's public health to stop evictions during the pandemic. So this CDC order went into effect in September and it was just extended this week for one additional month and now it runs through the end of July. So it is currently good law. That will likely be the last extension, but it is still in place um, for another month. And what it does is it, it, order, it basically prohibits evictions for what it calls covered covered persons, so that's the legal term. Covered persons are defined in the order. Um, they're basically tenants who sign a declaration that they've experienced a loss of income and have made their best efforts to pay rent and seek assistance. Um, now those the, technically they're, they have to, um, they have to test to five averments, and those are the ones that are listed in the declarations themselves. So what I said wasn't the, the technical language, um, but there's, they have to basically sign off on a legal document to a number of things related to their loss of income. So this CDC order can help, you know, has, can help many tenants and has helped uh, many tenants around the country. Um, but unfortunately, it's being applied quite unevenly. Um, several courts have struck down the CDC order. 
Um, and although it is, again, technically legally, it is still in effect, but it is pending a Supreme Court review. Um, and again, it's it's expires most likely. We you know for it, we'll have it for another month. Um, but you can all help tenants access this declaration. So I've included the um, link on uh, the slide and note that the declaration itself is translated into many languages on the CDC website and our partners at the National Low Income Housing Coalition also have it translated in additional languages on their website. And that, that link is at the end, I have a resource page at the end of the presentation. Um, so essentially what the tenant has to do is sign the declaration, assuming they can sign it and attest to all the, um, the statements, and then they present it to their landlord and are protected again, so long as they, as they qualify. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but because it can be difficult to apply the federal CDC order um, in you know, many states and local governments have implemented their own eviction moratoria during the pandemic um, and some are still in place. Um, and this slide is also from the eviction lab. The eviction lab was tracking all the state protections. And so that's another really important resource, resource after the presentation. You can all go look to see like what, what protections apply in, the, in, in my state. Um, and, you know, oftentimes they fill some of the gaps of the CDC order around the timing and who is covered, um, et cetera. Um, so, for example, New York's moratorium is in effect through August. California, hopefully Monday, we'll be voting on an extension of our state. I'm in California, our state mor uh, essentially moratorium um, through September. Um, so there are a number of states with laws in place. Um, and again, you can look at... Um, the eviction lab web website, which is a great resource. So, but but bottom line, um, because of the patchwork of eviction protections and because of the holes in the set, the federal CDC moratorium, um, it's really important that tenants that are at risk of eviction seek legal assistance. Um, so if there's one thing you take away from my presentation, it will be um, if you're working with patrons who may be facing housing instability, um, try to locate the local legal services office for help. Um, and also on my resource slide, I'll show you where I have a couple of really great resources to find local legal services, free legal services or low cost for, for um, lower income families um, because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's some, these, some of these laws are incredibly complicated. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so then we'll turn to the rental relief, which is again a key component sort of dealing with like stopping evictions in the short term right now. Um, so we currently have an estimated rent shortfall around the country about $7 billion. Um, so that number is probably low um, for a couple of reasons. One is that a lot of renters didn't, you know, maybe paid their rent, but they have a lot of credit card debt now, or they borrowed money from family. Um, so we think that number is relatively low. Um, and some federal money has gone out for emergency, for tenant assistance. And so, um, so that's been, it's been mitigated a bit in that way. A total of about $46 billion has been appropriated by the federal government to help tenants um, in the wake of the pandemic. And a lot of that money can go to help pay with unpaid rent and utilities, and then um, thing you know in some cases things like moving costs. The problem is right now is that the money has been really slow to go out. It's sort of been trickling through. It's federal money that's funneled through these state and local programs, and um, there have been a lot of issues. Understandably, this program is completely unprecedented, and it's a lot of money. And so you know there's been issues with delays, and then in some cases landlords are refusing the money. So we've seen we've seen improvements. The new administration came in and kind of made some really important improvements and continues to. So we anticipate that the money will start flowing more freely soon. But by bottom line is there's a lot of money for tenants and landlords right now. Um, and so this is another area that all of you can help local pa patrons really access these rental assistance programs. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see, I'm going to show you guys a couple of resources for this. One is the National Low Income Housing Coalition has an incredible um, resource on its on this page where you can go and look, find out where, you know, look, search for your locality and it will tell you the local rental assistance programs that are dispersing those federal funds. Um, so where they, where our tenants can go and apply if they, if they don't think they can pay their rent. And then on the next slide, um, there's another great resource from the National Council of State Housing Agencies. Similarly, has a really great um, way. It's easy to navigate to find out what 
local rental assistance programs um, people can access in your area. Um, and then next slide, please. So I, I've included um, um, on the um, video, thing, if you don't mind going, to, thank you, perfect. Um, so I've included some longer term solutions, right? I think we talked about, in fact, the moratorium and the rent relief are really to um, knowing those resources key right now to, to stemming this wave. Um, but there are other longer term solutions that our organization and many others are working right now at all levels of government. Um, and one example is eviction diversion programs that I have on here, right? And so if we can help tenants get the help they need before a landlord even files evictions, you, you can really avoid some of the lasting impacts that we know evictions have on families um, and communities. Um, so I just wanted to sort of end on a more uplifting note of there, you know, we sort of have a lot, we, you know, there's a lot, we have a lot of recommendations at, around sort of how to, how to deal with this problem in the long term, um, you know, well after the effects of, um, the protections from uh, COVID um, are ex expire. Um, so next slide, please. And this is my last slide. And I just wanted to highlight some of the resources that I mentioned throughout the presentation. Again, I've circled local legal aid, which I'm sure some of the co-presenters will talk more about, but that's really key right now um, that if you're working with uh, patrons that, um, you know, may be experiencing housing instability, aren't sure how to pay rent. Um, you can point them towards rental assistance, but also important to hook people up with their local legal services organization. Um, so, so those, um, so here are the resources. I'm really ex looking forward to the discussion with all of you about sort of um, what you all are doing at your local library, um, and perhaps in partnership with different community groups to assist tenants that are at risk of eviction. So with that, I'll turn it over, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. And do you want to keep this up or should we stop sharing? It's oh, I think, you. oh, you can stop sharing. I, I assume okay. these are, my guess is these will be available. Yeah, we, we will definitely make the slides available for everyone. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. And I put some of the links in the chat. So um, you can look back through there if you want to see some of those links. Um, so next we have Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Sherman, Executive Director of the Greater Syracuse Tenants Network. And we are um, a nonprofit organization. I am not a lawyer. Uh, the, my other two colleagues on the panel are attorneys. So um, I'm just a plain old tenant organizer. And uh, there aren't that many organizations across the country that just uh, serve tenants. In New York State, there's Greater Syracuse Tenants Network, United Tenants of Albany, United Tenants of Mount Vernon in Westchester, and a bunch of groups in New York City. So, and I think that's true across the country that there are tenant advocacy assistance groups in the major cities, but for most of the rest of the country, it really is our legal service organizations that are you know, on the front line in assisting tenants. I'm gonna speak mostly about use of the local library because that's what I'm familiar with. And uh, they play a very, very vital and important role in helping tenants, particularly due to the digital divide we have. And uh, so many things today are only accessible if you can get on the internet. And that puts a tremendous number of people at a great disadvantage. But libraries in Onondaga County where I live, um, they have computers and people who can help you with the computer. And as we, look at both the eviction crisis and the rent relief programs that are available. Um, this is where uh, libraries can and already are um, playing a very large role. And we're very happy that uh, our county library system has just finally returned to pretty much full service with anyone can just walk in when they need to because that is vital again, um, to people. So uh, the first thing with the eviction moratoriums, 
the federal one that is was available to the whole country. And uh, now, as Deborah said, has just been extended for one more month. Um, there is a form connected to uh, asking to be considered, I may not be saying in legalistic language, but tenants need to fill out a form to uh, claim this uh, protection against eviction. And that form is available online and could be filled out uh, at your local library and uh, then printed out. And uh, there's various places like giving it to your landlord and others. We still talk about trying to get legal service assistance, but the reality is that um, legal service agencies are really overwhelmed with people who their cases have already gone to court and trying to represent those people. Uh, I know that one of our groups called the Volunteer Lawyers Project sent out copies of these forms to tenants who called them, but getting the forms filled out and submitted is something that people who don't have access and also um, if your only access is through a phone, it's not a very easy way to fill out a form and get it printed so you have a copy. So that in New York State, as was mentioned, uh, there are so many different variations. New York State, we have an extension until August 31st for um, the COVID-related uh, issues. Very important to the tenants I speak to is that there are so many tenants who would have been evicted during this time period, but were not evicted because the courts were closed. And their lack of paying the rent was not related to eviction, uh, to COVID. They would have been evicted under normal circumstances. It's very important that those tenants are educated, that they need to seek legal help even faster because they're not going to be protected. And um, in other states, you know, I just was reading about uh, Texas where my colleague Sandy Rollins uh, has been quoted from the Texas Tenants Union. It is very, very dire there. Evictions are happening every day and it's not even clear that they're gonna pay attention to the CDC's latest extension. So what state you're in really matters. Um, so, uh, but the libraries in terms of helping people fill out these simple forms, submit them electronically, get a copy printed out so the tenant knows what they did. Um, that would be very helpful. Beyond that, there is a lot of money available, but um, it is, as has been mentioned, coming out very slowly. And that's because of government bu bureaucracy. Uh, the CARES Act money flowed through HUD. The second group of money flows through the Treasury Department. And these federal agencies are used to making their number one priority protecting against fraud. Well, right now, our number one priority should be getting the money out. And Congress did make a lot of improvements with the, the current program, the second batch of money that was on the slide um, to make it easier, but it's still pretty tough. Uh, it's very important, again, to uh, look at the resource about where the programs are located. Onondaga County, Syracuse, where I live, is one of the, I believe, only five municipalities in New York State that set up our own program to process the Treasury money. And we're just lucky that our county executive felt that it would be faster for tenants to apply through county government than through the state of New York. And that has proven to be true. So, you know, helping a tenant who moves in, who comes into you, 
perhaps finding out in advance how uh, go to the sites yourself and look at it before you would have to assist a tenant. Uh, the, the rent relief money is gonna last probably several months. So this is ongoing. Um, and another thing is a lot of people don't realize they're eligible. 80% of median income, I don't know how many of you are familiar with your locality. What is 80% of median? In Syracuse for a single person, it's, um, I'm looking at my chart, uh, it's um, $44,000. Um, but I bet you in California, the 80% of meeting is a lot more. So, but working people who I've heard them say, I never went to the government, I don't get welfare, I'm nothing like that. They don't realize that they're eligible for assistance because COVID was not income related in its impact. So very important to be knowledgeable so that someone's coming in seeking help, they may not realize um, that uh, there's protections. And I don't know if Deborah put up a source where people could go to, to look at what the median income is for their locality. Um, but maybe some of the librarians on this already know where that is, but it's, um, it's available. Um, let's see. There, again, the biggest thing I find is um, there's, a, there's so much information available online and yet the average low-income person doesn't know how to access it and doesn't know it exists. Um, they could find out, you know, information on tenant laws in their locality or their state, tenant pr protections. So it's uh, very important to be knowledgeable about it in advance. So when somebody comes in, um, people are aware of it. The, um, you, one of the other issues that you can't resolve is that if a tenant applies via email um, the, for rent relief, the government is gonna to try to respond to them by email, but these tenants don't have email. So they just have to be careful. Um, there's usually a place where you could say that somebody else is assisting them and that they don't have email even though they were able with your help to apply for the funds. Another thing is if they do have email and they get a query from the entity that's distributing the rent relief, they may need to have assistance in coming into the library and having you scan a document and helping them to upload that document to send into the source. So if you're in a rural area of upstate New York and you've applied to the New York State program and you've applied to it electronically, you may get communication from them that they need further documents and you don't have a scanner and sending it US mail is going to take forever. So that's another feature that um, at least in Onondaga County, tenants can access at their local library and is very important. Um, you also should talk to your part-time workers at your institution because many people work part-time for the library and they may in fact be eligible just because you're working doesn't mean that you aren't eligible for rent relief. It also doesn't mean that you can't be evicted, obviously. So getting the word out, especially if your library is in an underserved area. Most of the counties have information on what areas of the county, what are the poverty areas where people are more likely to be evicted. And these are the places where, you know, in our county, again, we were, 
a lot of nonprofits were um, enlisted, even with a little money to help in this outreach, to try to go out into these underserved areas and get the information out and get people to apply. So um, I think there's a few things that I wanted to mention. I will say that um, we are very interested. I think New York is taking some strides. When we talk about right to counsel, people have a right to a lawyer in a minor, in some, in criminal matters, but at least in New York State, if you're getting evicted at this point, you don't have a right to be assigned a lawyer if you can't afford it. So we'd like to see, you know, the ability for any tenant appearing in an eviction court to have a lawyer. And um, we've been very successful in Syracuse in eviction diversion programs. And what that means, which again, local libraries can help, is under normal situations, tenants sometimes don't know that they're not getting everything they could get to help them pay the rent. And that includes people who, senior citizens who don't know that they could get food stamps so they'd have a little money for rent. They don't know that they could get energy assistance or you know different programs. And at HUD subsidized housing in Syracuse, our city government has paid for Catholic charities to come into these buildings and um, have tenants who are facing problems with paying their rent. They can get Catholic charities to be their case manager and try to figure it out and try to see maybe they can make a plan. Maybe there's a mistake in what the management's charging. So that's part of the problem that tenants don't know their rights and don't know all the sources available. Were there any questions in the chat, Linda? The, the, uh, Rachel asked about um, ways that we can educate librarians um, when it comes to these issues, because I think that's a, and that's a great question. And I think this kind of presentation is exactly how we can educate librarians, you know, well, and that we need to be talking with people like you who have these, um, these expertise. I would advise, just like Deborah said, read Matthew Desmond's book, Evicted. That's the worst. I mean, some of the things that occurred there are not legal in New York state, but part of it is not only knowing the laws, but understanding, I mean, a lot of times people say, oh, why don't they pay the rent? You know, you know they don't understand the complexity of being poor in America. And uh, also, you know, a lot of issues about cultural approaches to what's the important thing to, um, what's more important, you know, paying for your grandmother's funeral or paying the rent. And so reading more on, you know, causes of poverty, cultural issues to be, you know, more understanding of how people get into this place, besides learning about the laws and um, things of that nature. Yeah, I definitely recommend that book. And I, and I, that part where she had to pay for the, I forget which person it was, but that she, when she paid for her mother's funeral and forgo her rent, it was just, it's impactful. It's definitely a wonderful book to read. Um, thank you so much, Sharon. Um, we're gonna switch over to Kim um, so that we have time for Kim and then we'll open it up to further discussion at the end too. Thank you so much. Thanks, Linda and uh, Deborah and Sharon. You you really gave fantastic presentations with so much information, and um, I'll try not to duplicate the things that you've said, but give you um, some um, maybe some specifics of being a legal services attorney, boots on the ground, and also some big thoughts. Well, big thoughts. Some thoughts I had about how um, librarians and libraries can help serve um, tenants to prevent eviction. Um, so again, I'm Kim Morell. I'm a staff attorney at um, Legal Assistance of Western New York, which is in Ithaca, New York. 
so upstate. Um, we serve 14 counties, um, 13 of which are, are rural counties, uh, and we serve all of those counties with only seven offices. So um, I can give some perspective on how li libraries can be of service in that regard. Um, and just Legal Services is a nonprofit organization funded by different federal, state, local, and um, private sources. Um, so as Sharon was mentioning, um, some folks have the conception that if a person is poor and they have to go to court, they're entitled to counsel. And uh, such is not the case in, um, in most uh, civil matters. And so um, uh, nonprofit organizations like mine um, do our very best to, to meet the need, um, but there can be capacity issues. And so um, thinking about helping tenants do things pro se or without an attorney, um, you know, we have, we have web materials um, that uh, clients in our area, tenants in our area could be pointed toward on our, our, our website. So um, uh, I think that's what I have to say about um, Law New York. Um, I would also echo what um, Sharon was saying about um, uh, people thinking they may not qualify for, for whether it be um, the emergency rental assistance program or for representation from a program like Law New York. We represent people um, at 200% or below the federal poverty level. And so for a, uh, for a single person, that's um, a little over $25,000. For a family of four, that's $53,000. And that dollar can stretch further or less far, depending on where you are. Um, so um, I will also just comment, um, just to stress that the moratorium, the federal moratorium and state moratoriums are not blanket um, coverage. So just by submitting this, this declaration, um, you're not guaranteed. You must, first of all, qualify. Um, and the different states and federal government have different, um, different um, items that you have to attest to. Um, and the other thing, certainly in New York, and I've only been using the New York moratorium, not the, not the CDC moratorium, because it's been more advantageous. But in New York, there are ways around the moratorium that the landlord could claim that the tenant is a nuisance, so that even if it's a hardship for them to move. So, and the other thing I would add on the moratorium issue is that I have read that the fact that courts have been closed um, and or had moratoriums in effect has increased the number of illegal lockouts. So um, just, just comments while, the, while people were talking about the moratorium, um, or plural moratoriums. So my thoughts about working together uh, as um, libraries and um, service providers to tenants and, and tenants. Um, I, libraries provide access um, to information and the ability to share that information. And that's really what is at the heart of how, um, how the libraries could be of service to tenants and evictions. Um, speaking as a, as a legal services attorney, um, libraries can multiply my ability to serve. And I'll, I'll explain how. Um, so eviction prevention begins long before the court date. Um, and libraries can play a role in breaking the chain of events that happened before the court date by providing access to information, by um, directing people to, to um, websites with the right organizations. Um, and importantly, uh, spe especially in rural communities, um, sometimes I'm serving clients that live very far from, from my office and um, they may have transportation issues and technology issues and that's not just a rural issue. Um, and I have just last week, I had, the, um, I had a client in Rochester, which is about a two hour drive from Ithaca, uh, had the Rochester library um, scan and, um, and email me very necessary documents. And they were critical for me to evaluate. In this case, it was an unemployment um, insurance case, but that is also part of what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about the chain of events that lead to the eviction. Because it's not just, oh, you got a petition to show up in court. It's a whole series of things that, that will start with, 
either income problems or repair problems or, or, or maybe domestic violence and other issues. And um, particularly for tenants that don't have access to the technologies or are not close to uh, service providers. And that's not just law offices, that, that could be providing information to, to unemployment, um, whoever handles unemployment benefits in your state, um, Department of Social Services, a, a wide array of supportive services that, that they need access to. So I really see the library as being a critical link in um, helping people avert emergencies by making um, information and the transfer of information available. So again, having documents scanned to me is, is, is really, really helpful. Um, so reasons that some people might need access to the library for help. Uh, we talked about um, lack of transportation and, and rural distances. Um, we talked about um, uh, there's other reasons that they may not be able to get to the service provider's office, lack of reliable internet service or the, inabil or the inability to use that technology. Um, hopefully providing access to accurate information because there's a lot of misinformation. Uh, since, especially since the uh, pandemic, there have been a lot of local Facebook groups where people are providing support to one another. So just, um, just networks of strangers that are, are sharing information about you know, housing and unemployment and all these issues. And I can't, I, I really can't bring myself to look at them because the information is so very often inaccurate. So guiding people to, to reliable sources of information. Uh, as I was saying earlier, um, sometimes tenants either choose to represent themselves or due to capacity issues, we are unable to provide service to every single person. And so there are pro se materials um, available certainly on my organization's website. Um, and, um, oh, another important use of the library is um, actually using the space. So for, um, for, for lots of organizations, but for myself as a legal services provider, I might want to do um, uh, community outreach or public education or have a remote legal clinic. Um, so if there are community spaces available that could be shared with, with um, attorneys like myself or other, other service providers, um, we could help alleviate the need for, for um, tenants uh, and other folks to have to travel long distances. We can bring services to them. So um, those are the major points that I wanted to hit because so much was covered in the talk before me. Um, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Kim. That was fantastic. And I, I think um, one of the things I'll just point out, I think because we're from the same place, um, I, I know the mutual support group that you're, <laughs> one of them that you might be referring to. And uh, I mean, it's interesting to see that phenomenon of people are really wanting to help each other, but at the same time, it can propagate misinformation if you know, if you don't have full picture of things. And so I, I that one, I definitely understand that one. So um, we've had a couple of people uh, mentioning their own experiences, which is fantastic. It's very interesting to hear that. And then um, Heidi B, I just want to point out, um, talked about uh, renter's rights workshops that she, that her library has been putting on. Um, uh, in terms of questions for from the audience, if y'all want to keep um, asking questions, feel free to do that. I have a couple that I'm going to might throw out to you too. Um, Rachel too is um, asking if there are other ways to convince librarians that should educate themselves and how to use information. Um, uh, and I think that's something where um, you know part of it is people wanting to actually engage with this issue, and I I, I think. Um, yeah, if you have other ideas for how people could educate themselves um, on the issues, I think that would be good. But, um, 
I, I would suggest that if librarians were, were interested, reaching out to their local legal services program and um, making that connection and uh, asking either for information to be supplied or even suggesting opportunities to do community education or, or um, legal clinics, you know, remote outreach. Yeah, that's great. And also for even those of us who are academic librarians who are working in universities, just having programming on this, I think um, we have three speakers here who could be virtually invited potentially to do programming for um, uh, anyone. April's asking. Oh, oh sorry, I was Dip. thinking, sorry. No, I was just gonna chime in um, to, uh, um, so about the issue of how to reach people. I mean, I think that we are, um, be, because of the crisis right now, because of the numbers of evictions that we're likely to see in the coming months, there is this new effort, and I mentioned this in my last slide, but around really engaging the community on eviction prevention prior to the point where the landlord files. Because once a landlord files an eviction, it doesn't matter what happens with that case. I could I could win my case and I still have an eviction on my credit report forever. So people refer to this as like the new modern redlining because it just, the eviction will follow with you, follow you forever. Um, and it can make it really hard to, to, to seek housing. So, so I think there is this push to really get to people before we're at the point of having to defend them in the eviction. So I could imagine, that, and I know, you know, I know the Department of Justice just wrote a letter to state courts, um, really emphasizing these types of diversion programs and is dedicated to working with, you know, the courts and community groups, support services providers, you know, perhaps, you know, I think we're going to see people collaborating in a new way on eviction prevention that we haven't before. And I do think groups like all of you who are on, I mean, you're all on the front lines. I don't know if you consider yourself, but you know, I, I mean, I think a lot of ways, like, you know, you're, you're see, you know, your patrons, you're on the front lines. I'm sure people are, I know in San Francisco, like there are homeless services coordinators at the library. Um, so, you know, I think, I think to sort of maybe at least like, sort of have your eyes and ears to the ground on this issue, there might be opportunity um, at least to, edu you know, again, like be, you know, try to educate yourself on these programs and know where the correct referral is. I, I just think we're gonna see a proliferation of these diversion programs that are going to really force community groups to collaborate in new and very innovative ways on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else wanna? Sharon, did you want to chime in on this one? Okay, a <laughs> um, One other resource, most communities have what we call a continuum of care. That is a group of agencies dealing with homelessness that because HUD wants you to do it, they, band together in order to seek funds to deal with homelessness in your community. So in all of your communities, there probably is a group of organizations funded by HUD dollars to um, prevent homelessness. And that might be an easy group to reach out to, to see those agencies and what they offer. And, you know, because one thing we, didn't get to which you know we hope we don't but you may get an individual that is hanging out in your library because they're essentially homeless and knowing what the resources in your community are um for directing somebody to you know help so you know they're not spending their time in your library and then going back to sleep in the outside or sleep in a car or whatever. So very important to alert yourself to those services and also, yeah, to help somebody who, you know, besides seeking legal services, if they do become evicted um, because they lose in court, um, which happens, <laughs> unfortunately, then to be able to help them find the resources to get them shelter. Um, in the future. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question from April, and you've alluded to this somewhat, but uh, it's an interesting one, and one 
I had as well is, when do you think we'll see the full impact of COVID? Will there be interest in redoing this program next year? And I'd add on to that, do you think landlords are gonna to try to make up for lost money over the next year? Or how, what do you foresee in coming in the next year? Want me to go first this time? <laughs> sure, yes. I mean, we hope that we never am back at this again. So COVID, you know, but we know that we're in, we're always gonna be a rental crisis. Um, you know, one thing that was not mentioned, um, I don't think it was on Deborah's slide, is uh, Biden's proposal to make a Section 8 type program available to all people that need it, low income renters. And Section 8 means if you have a voucher, you don't pay any more than one third of your income in rent. So that's uh, one solution. Um, so we do look to the long-term solutions. Um, you know, I think we don't know when the impact of the COVID is going to be over. You know, um, the landlords certainly are frustrated because the moratoriums were supposed to end at this point, and then they were moved on and moved on. So there's no place that every, that the moratoriums are completely gone. So it's very hard to predict um, when the full impact of this whole crisis will be done. Maybe never, but we think that the homelessness part is coming up very soon. Mm -hmm. We think that, you know, I, I just, I would, I don't know that beyond this last, um, extension from the CDC and the New York State. I, I think that in September, we're gonna be pretty much done with moratoriums. And then we'll see how the market shakes out. I'll just jump in and I, I agree with you, Sharon. And I would add that there is an additional crisis coming when the, um, when the federal pandemic unemployment assistance benefits stop and they were not extended. So I believe that's September 5th of this year. And so on top of the, um, the housing crisis, um, now you have people that were getting by on, on, some, on some livable uh, unemployment benefits and that's going to disappear too. So that's gonna just add, um, you know, add to the problem. Yeah. I mean, I, this, they both answer the question quite eloquently. I will only add that we can sort of think about it different buckets of, of people in need, right? There's people who just need to catch up and the rental assistance is going to go really far for them because it'll help them pay the back rent that they owe. And then they, maybe their job, their hours go back up and they can continue renting. But then there's another group of people who, who probably can't afford the rent they have again. Um, and so to Sharon's point, that's where the long-term solutions come in and the, you know, increasing federally, federal subsidies for people is a huge, plays a huge role in that. Um, so you all, yeah. So to the extent you can all do advocacy in your local communities, that's another really important point, which is, you know, you can advocate with your local representative, with your representatives um, to increase funding for these programs so that we don't see these, you know, so that we have long-term solutions and we don't end up doing this every time um, there's a disaster. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. And we are out of time, unfortunately, <laughs> but thank you so much. This was a fantastic um, presentation and lots of great information. We will um, make the slides and the, the recording available to people. Um, I encourage you to share this with others. That's one way that you can educate people in our community is to let them know that this will be up and exists and people will have access to it. Um, Thank you. I want to thank all three of you for, for your work on this and being willing to do this with our community. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming to um, the program today. And I hope you continue to have a wonderful conference. Uh, and there are lots of things coming in the chat. I don't know if you're seeing those. But thank you. Um, and so, yeah, Rachel's asking about a go to our live guide. We do have a live guide that has the information about this particular panel. And I'll add the video and the, the slides to that as well um, so that you can share that information out um, when it's uh, later on and I'll share that with you the presenters as well um, after we have it together. So 
right. Well, thank you. Thank you to everyone for coming. Um, thank you again to Deborah, Kim, and Sharon. And thank you, Taylor, for helping us out um, with the recording. And thank you, Linda. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Kim. Great to see you all. Uh, thanks, Sharon. Thanks. Everybody. Bye, everybody. Take care.